Good morning, and welcome to our worship service for Sunday, March the 21st, 2021. It's the fifth Sunday in Lent. Session met on Monday, March the 15th, and here are a few things that were decided. Uh, session gave approval for the purchase of some video equipment to be able to record and produce worship from the sanctuary going forward. In addition to the Palm Parade, on March the 28th and the Easter sunrise service on April the 4th, outdoor in-person worship will be offered on April the 18th and the 25th, weather permitting. Indoor in-person worship will resume on May the 2nd. Worship guidelines and procedures are still being developed and they will be shared as soon as they are complete. Online worship will continue when in-person worship resumes. So because of the recording equipment and things that we've bought, um, you'll probably continue to see worship online in this format. It will be available at least until mid-May, so just to give us a couple of weeks of overlap while we work out the, the new system in the sanctuary and make sure everything's working. Um, we're, we're committed to making sure that there is an online worship option for folks going forward um, from here on out. Um, whether it's this format from my basement or whether it's, you know, the recorded version from In the Sanctuary. But there will be a worship option. Um, I just want to make that absolutely clear that that is not going away. So for those who are not yet ready to come back to the sanctuary or are not able to, you will still be able to worship with us online as long as we have access to the internet. How about that? So, uh, also changed... Um, church usage. Uh, session has opened the use of Fellowship Hall to the church family for private events, um, and that starts on Monday, March the 22nd. There's some new parameters and guidelines, so just get in touch with, with Anne in the church office, and she can walk you through that process. Uh, we also have Fellowship by Zoom. That is still happening, um, and will happen until we start meeting in person here. So we'll do it this week. Um, next week we won't because we'll have the Palm Parade outside. Um, so just bear that in mind. But we will be together on Zoom at 11 o'clock this morning. And don't forget about one great hour of sharing. That collection is still being taken. You also should have received a Holy Week schedule that Ann put together. And it's got everything that we're doing during Holy Week. Um, Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and then Easter sunrise and Easter worship. So be sure to take note of that and, and note all the things we have going on that week. Uh, the diaper drive continues. Be sure to, to get your donations for that turned in. And then also don't forget about the CCA food pantry and the noisy collection. Those also continue. There's a number of, of birthdays this week. Be sure to take note of those and let folks know that you're thinking about them. I think that's all for announcements. Those were the big ones for this week. So uh, let's continue with our time of worship together. Let's begin with our call to worship. God's mercy floods over us. Lord, wash me clean of the pain in my life. God's love pours into us. Lord, pour your love into every pore of my being. Let the love and mercy of God reign in your heart today. Be with me, Lord, and guide my life. Our first hymn is Be Thou My Vision.
continue with the call to confession. Lord, be with us this day as we commit ourselves to being your disciples. Help us to face the future unafraid, trusting in your loving care and presence with us as we come before you in prayer. Compassionate Lord, forgive us when we falter on this Lenten pathway, when the road ahead seems too uncertain and we are afraid. We admit that following Jesus is not an easy task. Jesus requires us to be willing to make the ultimate commitment of our whole lives, and we hesitate and hold back. Draw us back to you, Lord. Give us confidence and courage to face the future with hope. Let us place our trust in you that the message of peace and mercy you have given to us through Jesus Christ may be offered to others through our own witness to your healing mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Even though the future is clouded, God is with us, guiding, healing, comforting, restoring. Rejoice. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven and healed. We'll continue with the Gloria Patri and with our special music. reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verse 31, through chapter 19, verse 10. Then Jesus took the twelve aside and said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked and insulted and spat upon. After they have flogged him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. But they understood nothing about all these things. In fact, what he said was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. As he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard a crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. 
Then he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he shouted even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me see again. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, praised God. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek out and to save the lost. Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This three part of stories is another instance where the lectionary has given us a group of stories that we don't normally read together. So when we do that, there, I mean, there's a reason why they've put them together, in part because Luke meant them to be together. So let's take them quickly, each one at a time, and then we'll look at, you know, sort of the bigger theme that runs through them. So first we have Jesus' third passion prediction, as it's called. Jesus, for the third time, is telling his disciples, we're going to Jerusalem and I'm going to die. That, you know, the end is, is very close. We're almost there. And this one's a little different because he really doesn't even mention the Jews at all. He says he's going to be handed over to the Gentiles, which means the Romans. And the Romans are going to do all these things to him and they're going to kill him. But the disciples still don't understand. I mean, it, they understood nothing about all these things. So they couldn't see where he was taking them, why he was doing it. They, they couldn't comprehend. Let's move to the second story. Jesus is now coming into Jericho, and there's a blind man begging outside the city. Now, he can hear what's coming, and there's a huge crowd and lots of noise. So he calls out and asks, hey, what's, you know, what's going on? And someone tells him that Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And this blind man does something that no one else in the Gospel of Luke has done since way back at the Nativity. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David. Now that's really important because we just talked about we're heading to Jerusalem, and we're almost there. Jericho and Jerusalem are not that far apart. And next week is Palm Sunday, so you know we're almost there. By saying Son of David, he's calling, calling out the Messiah. And that has political ramifications. By doing this, he has put Jesus and the disciples into grave danger. Because the Romans are not going to just sit idly by while some king shows up and tries to take over the place. And among the Jews, the idea of the Messiah means that we're going to overthrow the powers that be. 
that God's kingdom is being ushered in. And that's great, but that's going to come at a cost. And so by, by yelling this, son of David, the people in the crowd, they could be trying to quiet him for a couple of reasons. One could just be that he's being really loud and kind of obnoxious and they don't want to hear it. And just go sit and be quiet while, while we're talking. Just stop. But the other reason could be that he's putting them in danger. Because Jericho, and this now leads us into the third story, Jericho was a huge place for import-export. A lot of goods came in and out of Jericho, which means a lot of money and a lot of Romans were in Jericho. And while we're in Jericho, we meet the chief tax collector, Zacchaeus. Now, Zacchaeus is Jewish, but he's a collaborator. He's the chief tax collector for the Romans, which means he put out a contract saying he could collect this much money, which he would do, but he had to pay that money up front, which means he already had to have money and he had to be willing to do whatever it took to make that money back and then some. Which means he had other tax collectors working for him. In our culture, we'd, we'd liken him to probably more of a loan shark than we would the IRS. But something interesting to note, the way the tax system is working, most of the taxes, sure, they're coming from the people, but a lot of them are coming on the goods coming in and out of Jericho. And it's important to know that, I mean, even in this country, we did that. I mean, it used to be the New York Customs House was the place where more tax revenue for the U.S. government got raised than anywhere back before we had regular income taxes. That's the way money got made, was goods coming in and out. And so if you were a business owner, you really hated having to deal with the customs house because you always had to grease a few palms and you always had to, you know, have a little extra for the, for the customs guys. Same kind of thing goes on here. These are not, you know, squeaky clean auditors. These are people shaking somebody down for money. I mean, this is not a nice person. So it always fascinated me that we use Zacchaeus as a children's story. Really? And, and when you think about it, think about if you were going to tell the story of Zacchaeus to a kid, you know, the story we learned in Sunday school, what do you say? Think of the song. Zacchaeus was this wee little man and he climbed up in a sycamore tree to see what he could see. We don't focus on the fact that he was, you know, shaking people down for money and the fact that the whole town hated him. And the fact <laughs> we don't, we don't deal with any of that. It's more that well, see, Zacchaeus was, was short, he was a small person, and people overlooked him, but Jesus didn't, just like Jesus doesn't overlook all you kids, and Jesus loves you all just the way you are. I mean, it, it, that's what we tell kids. That's the children's version of Zacchaeus, and we miss all the political stuff that's going on in there. I mean, rightly so, because most six-year-olds don't need to hear all that, but the problem for us is we never got beyond the Sunday school version of Zacchaeus. The same as we did with Jonah and, and Noah and all the other famous Sunday school stories. When we come at them as adults, we still come at them like we're in the third grade. We don't dig underneath what's really going on. And so when we isolate those stories, I think we're more apt to do that. And so Zacchaeus has got some really important undertones going on. We've just had Jesus say, I'm headed to Jerusalem, and the Romans are going to kill me. And the disciples can't see what's going on. The second story, we have a blind beggar calling out to Jesus as the Messiah, as the son of David, right outside the gates of Jericho, where there's Romans all over the place. And now we go into the city, and Jesus is about to eat with one of the chief collaborators with the Romans. All of this together, none of that came up in Sunday school. I guarantee you, it did not come up in Sunday school when we were children. Because there's so much more political ramifications going on in all of this. 
And so when we're reading this in bigger chunks, you see that woven through. Luke is very much focused on the political ramifications of Jesus, the economic ramifications, the societal ramifications. All that comes up again and again and again. I mean, there's about five stories in a row about rich men. We didn't read them all, but you have, you know, the rich young ruler and you have the foolish rich steward and you have, you know, the the lost coin and then you have the prodigal son, which is also a story about money and frittering away wealth. And then you have the rich man and Lazarus. And then, I mean, we've had a whole bunch of them. And then here, the richest one of them all, Zacchaeus. The difference is here, we finally, oh, I forgot. There's one more story in there we didn't read. The rich man going through the eye of the needle. You know, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man. That's in here too. And here we have Zacchaeus at the end of all of this. And finally, we have a righteous rich man. Because by the end of the story, Zacchaeus has been changed. You know, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus and can't give up his wealth. The rich man, you know, and Lazarus, he's still trying to order Lazarus around even after he's dead. But here, here we have a man who was willing to make a fool of himself. Proper Roman and or Jewish men, men of property, of substance, of quality, they don't run, ever. Because you're wearing togas and robes. And the only way to do that is to hike them up and run. And you don't do that. Because it's not dignified. You should have no reason to run. Because the only reason you'd ever have to run would be to run away from something. But that's not something a proper Roman would do. You would turn and face it. And if they killed you, then so be it. Only cowards run. I mean, that's the understanding. So you would have no reason to run. You don't run for pleasure or for exercise. Why would you do that? No, no, no. You have other people to do that. Errand boys run. Slaves run. Children run. Men don't run. The other thing men don't do is climb trees. Because yet again, you're wearing loose open ropes. You don't climb a tree because then everybody can see up them. Same thing, you know, the rules apply to wearing a skirt, you know. It's the same idea. You don't climb a tree because it's not dignified. So here this man is willing to leave all his dignity. He runs ahead and climbs a tree. He's willing to set aside his dignity, his pride, his good name, whatever's left of it, for the chance to see Jesus. Not even to talk to him, just to see him. Here you had disciples who can't see, a blind man who's given the ability to see again, and now a man who wants nothing more than to see Jesus. And what happens? Jesus sees him and says, I'm coming to your house, let's go. I mean, what he does is confer incredible honor. Here's the visiting rabbi that crowds are following, that people are calling out as the Messiah. And he is allowing Zacchaeus to be his host and show him hospitality, which is a huge honor. I don't think most of us would see it that way if someone just invited themselves over. Um, we don't view that as an honor. <laughs> but in that time and place, that was a huge honor that Zacchaeus was allowed to do that. And he proceeds to tell Jesus, you know, I'm giving away half of what I own. And if I've defrauded anybody, I will pay it four times, which is the highest amount required in the law to repay someone. Because in some cases, it's just you just have to give restitution. In other cases, pay twice what you took. And other times, it's times four what you took. So he says, if I've defrauded anyone, I'll pay them the most I have to. And that's when Jesus says that, you know, today salvation has come to this house, that Zacchaeus's eyes have been opened. 
he sees what what he's supposed to be. He sees what what wealth really means, which is nothing. That that's not what's important. He's finally seen what he needs to see. And so all of this, all of these coming together are all in preparation to get us to Jerusalem. Because there's only, you know, one more story that gets told in Jericho and then we're there. So, I mean, this is what what Luke is focusing in on as the last things Jesus is teaching before he enters Jerusalem. This whole phase of his ministry is coming to an end. And here we are at the end. And according to the Jewish leaders, what is he doing? He's, you know, talking to beggars and, and eating with tax collectors. What is, he, what is he all about? Why is he doing this? They still don't get it, just like the disciples still don't get it, like so many still don't get it. And that's some of what we'll talk about next week. But this emphasis on, on seeing and on understanding what we're seeing, you know, we still have that problem. We still can be just like the disciples. Some of us are just like the blind man. And then others of us are like Zacchaeus, who want desperately to see, who just want to see Jesus. Salvation is about more than the personal and, and the private changes and motivations that go on in us. The story about Zacchaeus at the end, when it says, today salvation has come, it doesn't say to this man, it says to this house, when we change, that change is about more than just us. It's about all those around us too. And that's part of what Jesus is talking about. By changing ourselves, we can then in turn change the world. We have to be able to, you know, people need to see it in us. We can't see Jesus in the flesh anymore. We can only see Jesus in those around us who witness to that, who witness to that life, who witness to that change. That's how we see Jesus in the world now, is through other people. That's what we have to keep looking for. That's what we have to keep showing so that hopefully others will come to understand, will come to see that in us. And we'll see it in one another. And so all of this, those outward manifestations, all of that is what makes faith observable. It makes it real. It makes it, it, it makes it, you know, useful and, and it changes the world. It changes the world. And so that's the story of all of this is seeing and being seen, understanding and being understood, witnessing and knowing and understanding and sharing all of that. That's what all these stories leading into Jerusalem are about. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear God, there's no matter how much we study, no matter how much we read, how much we learn, there's always more to know. There's always more to try to absorb and understand and comprehend. But in the end, what it becomes about is not just about how much knowledge we have in our heads, but how much we're willing to share that with the world to share that with those around us, to, to let that knowledge change us, not just reside in us. Are we willing to be changed? And so, Lord, let us be changed. Let people see you in us 
see and understand all that you are, all that you have been, and all that you continue to be to all of us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So for our time of tithes and offerings, just a quick reminder, as I said before, about one great hour of sharing. Um, that is coming up here on Easter Sunday is when that special offering ends. So be sure to include a contribution to that if you can. Um, it's an important witness that we give as a denomination and have done for many, many decades. Um, some, some huge programs, so many people, so many lives touched through those programs. But many thanks to, to so many of you. Um, we're getting really close to the time when we'll be able to be in person together again, those of us who, who want to do that. It's, it's going to be, you know, it'll be interesting. It's going to be a time we still have to work out details and figure out what needs to happen next. But lots of folks have stepped up to try to make this as safe and well thought out as possible. And so many thanks to all of you for your continued help and your continued patience with all of this. Um, we're fortunate enough to be able to use funds to, to get a, a video camera, you know, on a computer to help run all this so that we can continue to do this online. I mean, those kind of things don't happen for free. So many thanks to, to all of you for all the different ways you continue to help. Um, whether it's, you know, helping research and find all this stuff or, you know, serving on the committees and, and just helping us think through everything. Um, it's, it's been a huge help. And many thanks to, to all of you who continue to pray for the leaders of the church. That's really important because this has been, you know, this crew of session members and, and the last crew had to make decisions that nobody else has had to make. And, and they've needed your prayers and, and your spirit to help pull them through and help them make the best decisions we could for everybody. So thanks to all of you for your continued support and patience and love. And let's sing together the doxology. Let's continue with the prayer of dedication. As we offer our hearts and gifts, may we have the same mind as Christ, remembering those who have so little, thinking of all the ways we can serve, trusting completely in your love and grace, holy God. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. And now let's continue with our prayers of the people. As always, be sure to lift up the names who are on our, our weekly prayer list. There are still many names there, many folks in need of prayer. Let us pray. Beloved friends, in this season of repentance and healing, we accept God's invitation to be ever mindful of the needs of others, offering our prayers on behalf of God's community in the church and in the world. We pray for the beauty of the earth, that we may be ever more dedicated to protecting and preserving what you have entrusted to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For religious communities, Lord, that they may share peace and love and justice with each other and the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. for leaders around the world, that they may devote themselves to service and compassion toward their citizens and others. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. For the lonely and the brokenhearted, that they may find support and community and experience your great love for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who suffer in mind or body, that they may know your presence and find comfort and healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That we may go forth from our worship in order to love and serve our neighbors. We pray, Lord, for all of us, that you may be seen in us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all the saints who now rest in you. We pray that we may follow in their footsteps, that we may become the guiding light to others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Fill us with strength, O Lord, to resist the world, to walk in righteousness with you, rejoicing with an upright heart. As Jesus taught us with his most famous words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we'll extinguish our Lenten candle. As we come together this day, think for a moment about the word sanctuary and all the different things it can mean. Mostly it means a place set aside for sacred things. We can have sanctuaries out in nature for birds or for other animals, just as we have a sanctuary for us. It's a place of refuge. It's a place of protection. The season of Lent is sort of like a sanctuary. It's a period of time. And one of the things that Lent teaches us is that we too are a sanctuary. That there's a place inside of us for sacred things. A place where the sacred can happen. A place where God abides. That's how we often think of the sanctuary. It's a place where we find God. And so let us be a sanctuary, a place where others can see God, can witness God, and all that God loves about humanity. As we extinguish this light, let us acknowledge the darkness and the pain in all the places in our world that aren't a sanctuary, that aren't a place of of peace and of rest and of solace and of understanding. Loving God, we open our hearts to you. We invite you into our inmost being only to find that you're already there. Strengthen us in our quiet places and lead us into the work of justice and of peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is Open My Eyes That I May See.
And now hear these words of benediction. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being there. Christ lives in you and has something he wants to do through you wherever you are. Believe this and go in the grace and the love and the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace.